Our second article today is, um, is examining a very common marketing practice using uh, incentives basically to stimulate word of mouth and uh, worrying that the use of these incentives can backfire and have a negative effect on word of mouth. Uh, this forthcoming paper in the Journal of Marketing explores how marketers can actually fuel positive word of mouth without using explicit incentives, which I think it will be a really big help to marketers to learn some of these, uh, to gain some of these insights. So uh, we're fortunate to be joined by uh, Monica uh, Lisiak uh, from Arizona State University and Andrea Bonetzi from New York University uh, to present to us today. So welcome Monica and Andrea, uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. And I would like to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm very excited to be here and talk about how marketing perks can influence word of mouth. If we can click on the next slide. Um, you should have you should have control now. It may take one second. There you go. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Word of mouth is arguably the most trusted form of advertising. In fact, a recent survey by Nielsen suggests that customers uh, trust 92% of customers trust uh, word of mouth recommendations over any other form of advertising. And indeed, recent estimates suggest that word of mouth drives as much as $6 trillion in consumer spending, which is huge. And because word of mouth is so important, marketers often try to fuel word of mouth by using incentives. Classic programs are referral programs. For example, if you refer friends, you can make money, as this ad uh, suggests. Another example involves incentivizing customers um, to write a review uh, for a certain product. Now, what's common among these uh, practices is that they all involve a very strong behavior reward contingency in the sense that you can get a reward, you can get your carrot only if you engage in very specific behavior, such as referring a friend or writing a review. And these incentives can be effective to the extent to which people find the carrot or the reward uh, appealing. However, these incentives do also have some serious drawbacks, which marketers often neglect. For example, studies shows that referral programs often heighten relational concerns, meaning that people start worrying uh, that if they refer a friend, that may actually compromise their relationship, which makes a lot of sense. Nobody wants to be viewed as the person who sells a friend for a carrot or for a reward. And so as a result, they may be actually even less likely to uh, recommend a friend and engage in word of mouth than they would be otherwise. Further, studies shows that uh, when you pay someone to, to promote a cause, people perceive uh, that message as uh, less sincere and as a result are less persuaded by that message. And so together, I think these studies show that uh, using incentives, while it can be beneficial in some cases, it also has some, it also has some serious uh, drawbacks and it can backfire. Now, we propose one possible solution to this problem, which is to use non-incentivized word of mouth in addition to incentivized word of mouth. And we suggest that common perks, such as freebies, gifts, and other benefits that the company usually have in their cool toolkit, they can be used to foster non-incentivized word of mouth. Importantly, we find that whether this uh, perks are effective at fostering word of mouth depends on their level of contractuality. Now, what is contractuality? Well, perks vary in terms of how contractual they are. On one end of the spectrum, you can have high contractual perks where the behavior reward contingency is very salient. And as a result, people perceive that these perks comes, come with strings attached. On the other end of the spectrum, however, you can have low contractual perks. Here, the behavior reward contingency may be less salient and people perceive these perks as coming with fewer strings attached. Now, what's interesting is that the exact same perk 
can be perceived as either high or low in contractuality, depending on how it is framed. And what we're proposing is to frame at least some perks in a less contractual manner, because that can foster word of mouth. Let me illustrate this idea with a few examples. So the first example I have is in the context of birthday freebies. Uh, here in the United States and also abroad, it's very common that companies would gift a freebie to customers to celebrate their birthday. Now, some companies um, such as Starbucks give high, very high freebies with high level of contractuality in the sense that you have to come in on the exact same day of the birthday. And sometimes you also have to spend a certain amount of money to qualify for your birthday freebie, which is not exactly what friends do, thankfully. Other companies, however, um, such as Sephora, they give freebies with fewer um, strings attached in the sense that they give a birthday freebie whenever customers come in. And so you can see that basically depending on how the company frames uh, the, and constructs the choice, freebies could be perceived as either higher or lower in contractuality. Let me, let's look at another example. This one is in the context of loyalty programs. Uh, many companies such as uh, Duncan and Subway provide high contractual perks in the sense that we have to spend a certain amount of money to get a free item. Other companies, however, such as Chick-fil-A, they also give you perks that are low in contractuality. So these companies also award you a perk based on how much you purchased, but they don't tell you that. And so as a result, customers don't perceive that behavior reward contingency and feel that those perks come with fewer strings attached. Now, we tested the idea of whether indeed uh, framing perks as low in contractuality would foster word of mouth in a field study uh, conducted at a bookstore uh, who was affiliated with a local university. And we recruited a research assistant who stopped shoppers at the bookstore and the research assistant acted as an employee. And in the high contractuality per condition, uh, customers or shoppers were told that they can get a $5 bookstore gift card if they fill out a customer survey for, for the bookstore. In contrast, in the low contractuality condition, they were asked if they wanna fill out the customer survey for the bookstore, and then they were given a $5 bookstore gift card as a gift. So what's important here to notice is that in both cases, customers engage in the exact same amount of effort and they receive the exact same FERC, which was a $5 gift card. Afterwards, customers continued with their shopping trip, and then they were intercepted by a second employee who told them that the bookstore was uh, trying to revamp their uh, Instagram account, which was actually true. And um, the employee invited them to check out the account and to give some social media likes. And what, we're, we were, what we were interested in, our focal marketing outcome, was the number of Insta Instagram likes that the bookstore would receive within a week. And we were able to track who liked the bookstore because as part of the survey, uh, we asked them for their Instagram handle. Let's look at the results. Let's look at who liked the bookstore. So as this picture shows, people who received a perk that was low in contractuality gave more um, social media likes on average than people who received the perk high in contractuality. And what's interesting is that even the cost uh, was lower for the low contractuality perk in the sense that that perk was most cost, cost effective. Now, Andrea is going to tell you more about why this, this effect occur. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, so why is it that low contractuality perks uh, foster more word of mouth than high contractuality perks? Uh, the logic that we propose is actually very simple. And the idea is that a perk that is low in contractuality is more likely to convey the relational signal that the brand cares, values, and appreciates us as customers. It makes us feel valued. So the idea is that uh, salient if-then contingency just gives us the message, the company is just giving me what I earned, right? So it's not really uh, uh, taking care of me, it's just fulfilling a contractual obligation. The moment you remove the salience of that if-then reward contingency, now it feels that the company is doing something for us. Uh, so it's a much stronger signal that the brand 
values us as customers. It makes us feel valued. And when we feel valued, we are drawn closer to those others that have expressed that value and that appreciation, and we feel more motivated to support them. And in the context that we are exploring, how do we support the company? We support the company by engaging in advocacy, fundamentally, by engaging in positive word of mouth. Now, of course, this logic hinges on uh, an important assumption. And the assumption is, uh, uh, next slide, Monica, if you can. And uh, the, the assumption is that uh, the signal is perceived to be authentic. If the authenticity of the signal is undermined, then perks that are low in contractuality, actually, rather than making us feel valued, they might make us feel manipulated. And in that case, of course, they, be, they, they backfire big time. And what we find in our research uh, uh, is that uh, uh, a situation that is particularly likely to produce these effects is when perks that are characterized by lower contractuality are awarded by uh, companies, brands, uh, uh, people that we dislike or that we distrust. Uh, the idea being that when we receive uh, 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 a gift, right, that is supposed uh, uh, to be a nice, selfless, in a certain sense, gestures from someone that we don't trust, we don't immediately think, oh, how nice this person is. We immediately think what's going on here, right? What is this person trying to get out of me, in a certain sense? So they induce skepticism and they make us feel manipulated. Uh, and in this case, again, we, you are better off sticking with uh, uh, perks that are high in contractuality rather than perks that are low in contractuality. So I'm going to illustrate this with one of the experiments that we run uh, in our uh, research. Uh, in this experiment, uh, we had respondents uh, uh, think about uh, a situation where they were purchasing insurance. And they were purchasing insurance by interacting either with a regular insurance agent, so let's say a neutral kind of situation, or with a distrusted telemarketing agent, right? So a situation that already puts us on the alert in a certain sense, tells us there might be something uh, that we uh, need to be careful about here. Uh, and then participants read that uh, during the conversation, the agent uh, gives them a gift, a gift that is either high in contractuality or low in contractuality. Uh, we manipulated this across respondents. So in certain respondents basically read that the gift is given to them if they fill out a survey. So the if then contingency is very clear. It's a highly contractual uh, kind of situation. Other responders are simply told that the agent gives them this gift with no strings attached. Okay, so low contractual type of perk. And then we simply ask respondents, how likely would you be to advocate for this company to spread positive word of mouth about this insurance company? And what we find is on the left hand side, the basic effect that Monica talked about earlier, uh, if uh, people imagine interacting with a neutral insurance agent, then these low contractuality perks work better than the high contractuality perk. They were more likely to engage in word of mouth after receiving this uh, gift with no strings attached rather than after receiving a gift in exchange for completing a survey. But interestingly, if you look on the right hand side, when they were interacting with this distrusted agent, now actually the gift, the low contractuality gift actually backfired. People interpreted this as this uh, uh, manipulative attempt such that they were actually less likely to spread positive word of mouth after receiving these uh, uh, no strings attached type of gift rather than receiving a gift because they filled out the survey. So bottom line, what are the two key takeaways from our research? The first one uh, to uh, kind of circle back to what Monica was saying at the beginning of the presentation is a very simple idea. Uh, the idea that to foster non-incentivized word of mouth, we should try to use structure and frame perks in a way that is less contractual. How can we do so? Just a very simple example in the context of reward programs, typically people you, uh, companies use the language uh, that you see on the uh, left hand side. So they highlight how customers have earned rewards, the classic you've earned the reward now come and redeem it, right? That language really emphasizes the idea that the customer has put in a lot of effort has earned something through his or her own sweat and tears in a certain sense. On the right hand side, uh, a potential alternative approach to the same uh, um, type of setting. Why don't we emphasize that this is a token of our appreciation? So the company has still earned it, uh, but just the language emphasizes what the company is doing for the customer rather than all the effort that the customer had to put in to finally earn his precious reward. 
Second takeaway, of course, uh, is uh, the idea that uh, non-contractual perks are not a one size fits all. So we're not saying that now all perks should be characterized by low contractuality. We're saying that companies should try to balance their portfolio, thinking carefully about what type of behavior they're trying to incentivize. If you're trying to incentivize a behavior that does not hinge on a relationship, on having a close relationship between a company and a, a customer, such as you're trying to get me into your store this weekend, then high contractuality perks will work very well. Of course, incentives uh, most of the times do what we design them to do. But there are other behaviors for which incentives might not be uh, so high contractual perks, basically, might not be the best, uh, um, let's say, uh, thing to leverage. And these behaviors are behaviors that hinge on having a close relationship. Uh, what we talked about is advocacy. Typically, we advocate, we spread positive word of mouth uh, about something or someone that we like, that we feel close to, that we feel committed to, that we feel we have some kind of personal connection to. And so in this case, for these type of behaviors, what we want to do is work on that relationship, on building and strengthening that relationship. And so for those type of behaviors, rather than using high contractuality perks, we are better off using lowering the contractuality of the perks in those simple ways that we uh, discussed. OK. So I think we can stop here. Um, we'll open it up to questions. But first and foremost, we would like to uh, thank Chris for all the organization that, <laughs> that people don't get to see, but that goes on behind these talks. And uh, we would like to thank everybody for listening to us today. Thank you, Andrea and Monica. Um, let me take us to the Q&A slide. And I'll take control of the screen back, too. And I will actually just pop out of uh, sharing um, sharing my screen just because then we can um, answer, we can get into some of the, the Q&A. Um, so here we go. Okay, and uh, John just put uh, information in the chat about how to reach this, uh, this article and you know, then you can read it in detail, obviously, but let me, let's go ahead and, and, and answer your questions. Um, let's start with a, a general one that, um, it was occurring to me as we were, as I was listening to you, what do you think is really driving your, your findings? I was, I had two sort of underlying ideas. One was reciprocity, but then the other was surprise. Um, and I wondered what, what you all think, why is it that consumers actually do tend to, to kind of, if you will, give the gift of, of the positive word of mouth in these low uh, contractuality situ situations? I think that this is a very uh, interesting and valid question. We did, uh, across studies, measure reciprocity and surprise and controlled for, uh, for, for them statistically. And we show that our process holds uh, and goes above and beyond surprise uh, and, uh, and reciprocity. Uh, in terms of reciprocity, we also try to um, tease apart this alternative process uh, with an additional experiment. And in that experiment, we actually had three conditions. We had our low contractuality perk, a high contractuality perk, and a low contractuality perk in which we made salient the reciprocity norms. And then we asked people to basically whether they would like, uh, whether they would want to engage in word of mouth on two separate asks on two separate tasks. And our thinking was that if you feel indebted, which is what reciprocity is, this feeling of indebtedness and obligation, then you should engage in the first word of mouth ask. And once you repay the debt, then you should no longer engage in subsequent follow up word of mouth asks. However, if it's true that uh, low contractuality perk really makes you feel valued and makes you want to advocate essentially on behalf of the company, then you should be willing to advocate uh, on multiple occasions. And this is exactly what we found. We found that when we activated reciprocity norm, people were willing to engage in word of mouth once, and that was it. However, uh, when we just gave them our low contractuality perk, they were more willing to engage in it on two subsequent tasks, which is something really important for managers because it shows that um, low contractuality perk can have an enduring or a more um, sustained effect on word of mouth. That's, that's super interesting. So Nalia has written, written with a question about, she wonders if the economic value slash cost of the perk matters. For example, if a company gives out an expensive perk for no reason, 
maybe it would make consumers suspicious. What do you think? So it's a very, very, very big perk, in other words. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting point, actually. Uh, it's something that we haven't really explored empirically. Um, so I don't really know how to answer this question with data. Intuitively, I would agree with Nalia that uh, if something is too big, if it doesn't fit, let's say, my mental schema, it might raise uh, suspicion. Um, again, we we um, we just looked at one way to raise suspicion. That was uh, uh, the situation in which we don't trust others. There's many other ways, of course, to raise suspicion. This could be an interesting an interesting uh, um, thing to explore. Luckily, I don't think marketers are very prone to give out very expensive perks. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure if that really happens in the real world, but it's an interesting uh, point to think about. That's a good point. I, I was thinking about um, whether there are, you noted quantitative differences in the word of mouth sharing. I also wondered about qualitative differences, meaning is there something distinctive about the way in which people talk about the company? Because you know, you, you counted basically word of mouth in terms of the number that, that occurred in, in the bookstore study. But then if, if people do write about it very genuinely, for example, or very enthusiastically, do you expect that there would be amplification and subsequent amplification that might even make these effects bigger than you've noted in your initial sharing stage? Yes, that's very interesting. And actually, we did in one study ask people to, to write what they would write about the person, the company who gave them either a high or low contractuality perks. And then we had two coders, blind to hypothesis and conditions, go through those, um, those um, reviews, essentially, and then um, code them for whether they were positive or negative. And we did find that when people were given a low contractuality perks, not, not only they were more likely to write a review, but the actual content of that review were most was more positive, which was really nice. And the effects were very strong. So that gave us additional confidence in our findings. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important for marketers to know because it, it means your effects are probably, that they're probably going to be bigger uh, in, in reality. Um, so there's a question here from Brianna about considering the timing of the perks. Do you have any sense from your studies, uh, what's the optimal timing to distribute the perks along the customer journey? You want to take that, Monica, uh, with respect to the study that we have in the data? Sure. Do, uh, if you want to, I was doing one okay. one, but yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to take it. So we did actually, we do think the timing matters. And we do suggest, uh, we would recommend companies to give perks after uh, customers completed the purchase. In one study, we manipulated actually the timing and uh, we either gave a low contractuality or high contractuality perk before the purchase before the customer had to make up their mind and um, make a decision or afterwards. And what we find is that if you, uh, if you give it before, just before purchase, customers again have this feeling that they're being manipulated. And so the effect there doesn't reverse, but attenuates. So I would say that uh, context matters and how we give uh, perks matters. And so give them in a way where again, people don't feel that you're doing it to because you have some other objectives in mind, but that you're really giving it as an act of uh, caring for them. And that's when the effectiveness of word of mouth is going to be the highest. Yeah, that makes so much sense. That makes hey, so Chris, much can sense. I weigh in? Please, that? Derek. Derek Rooker is also just, here, please. Because I don't think I can ask questions as a, as a panelist, but I just <laughs> wanted to, to echo something Monica said, because I think it ties into the other presentation, which is just more generally, I think there are concerns about what does it mean to be an ethical marketer and what, you know, where, what are the boundaries? And what I would say is I think this is a great example of like, you know, I've trained a lot of great brand managers and I think genuinely a lot of them want to have, like they don't want to go grab beers with their consumers, but they actually do want to say, look, I want my consumers to value me. I do value my consumers. And so, you know, when we were talking about this project, I think this is, there's a, there's a lot of very real opportunities just to be more authentic. And that's kind of what it's saying. Like you really, you know, so if you're really just, I'm just buying, I'm just getting these gifts to motivate purchase. Like, okay, that's, not about a relationship, but if it's really like, I'm trying to reward and I'm trying to honor it, what this is saying is there's a way to communicate that better to people. So just wanted to echo that little point off of Monica. I think that's an important observation that 
you know, it's a portfolio play. And I think a lot of great brands really do want to have relationships. And so there's no inauthenticity there. And that to me takes care of the concerns about, is it unethical or manipulate? Well, not if it's genuine. And I honestly think a lot of great brands want those relationships. Interesting. Well, this is kind of, thanks for that comment, because it goes to another question, which is, do you have any intuition about how these low contractuality perks work better or worse, even potentially with different types of customers? So maybe customers that if you have people who have strong relationships with brands or weak relationships, do you expect any, any difference there? Uh, so that's an interesting question. It's something that we had, of course, uh, considered and, uh, and wondered ourselves. Uh, so empirically, actually, we don't uh, see uh, different people reacting differently in terms of stage of the relationship. And we wondered why that might have been the case. Uh, if you look at the um, psychology, let's say, literature, the psychology really suggests that uh, this feeling valued, appreciated, has two functions, serves two functions. One is uh, building relationships. So who do we want to uh, build the close relationships with? Well, usually not with people that uh, don't seem to like us, but usually with people that seem to like us, value and appreciate us, right? So a, a, a relationship formation type of purpose, let's say. But second, this idea of uh, uh, relational values, coding, so feeling value and appreciate is also really important uh, in terms of relationship maintenance. And I think uh, about, uh, I've been married for several years, and I think that often in a marriage after a while you fail to, I mean, you always value and appreciate your partner, right? But you fail to communicate that. And that sometimes undermines a little bit <laughs> the relationship. Uh, and so now, in all seriousness, um, the, the reason why do we, we speculate at least, we don't see different effects for different type of customers is that uh, uh, these feelings serve uh, both the function of relationship formation and relationship maintenance. Good. So let me quickly, we just have really one minute. So maybe you can quickly answer two questions. So Stan asks, does it matter the, 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 the person who delivers the perk? So if, if they're like a high status influencer versus a normal person, that's one thing. And then second, does it matter? Does, it, does the effectiveness of this approach vary by level of involvement? So if you're talking about coffee versus say life insurance, do you, what, do you have any quick thoughts on that while we close up here? These are very interesting ideas uh, that we haven't uh, that we haven't explored oh. empirically. Intuitively, I would think that the more you value the person, uh, so the higher the status of the person, the greater the effectiveness of this of this uh, of low contractuality perks should be on word of mouth because you feel more even more valued and appreciated given that it's coming from someone that you respect and admire. So intuitively, I would think that the effect would be more pronounced, uh, but we have not empirical data to back that up. Okay, well, I'm gonna thank you both. This was wonderful, super interesting stuff. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. So thank you. Thank you so much thank for you all you do. Thank you.